Welcome everyone. Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. I would like to extend that respect to all First Nations peoples from the lands that you are joining from. Welcome everyone to the AMC Biomfo Summer 2020 Public Lecture. I'm Angela Coughlin, Acting Research and Higher Education Manager at the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute. I'd like to start by thanking AMSI's funding partner, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, and our 2020 host university, the Australian National University. Tonight's public lecture is part of the AMSI Bioinfo Summer Conference, which started on Monday and finishes tomorrow. For those not attending the conference, Bioinfo Summer is an annual research training event for higher education students, early career researchers and professionals to develop their bioinformatics skills and connect with each other. Attendees hear from leading international and national researchers each morning and participate in hands-on afternoon workshops. They get the opportunity to put their science communication skills to the test um, through the e-poster competition and get inspired, we hope, to continue in the mathematical sciences through our career sessions. And this public lecture tonight is a cherry on top. So now let me introduce you to the person you're here to see tonight, Associate Professor um, Maui Hudson, Director of the Te Katoha Research Institute at the University of Waikato. Um, so I'll just give a brief, brief introduction. He's a busy man and a lot of things on the go, but I'll tell you a few things and he'll expand on them in his presentation tonight. So Maui is a member of the Whakatoe, Nga Ruhina and Te Mahure Hure Iwi in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. He's a member of the Whakatoa Maori Trust Board and a number of other tribal entities. Maui is a founding member of the Te Manahi Rona Maori Data Sovereignty Network and the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. He's a co-convener of Sing Aotearoa, a capacity building initiative for Indigenous genomics and organised the first Sing Indigenous Genomics Conference in Hamilton, New Zealand earlier this year. Um, he also co-authored the Te Mara Ira Guidelines for Genomic Research with Maori He's a member of the senior leadership team for genomics um, Aotearoa and is a part of a team developing biocultural labels to recognize indigenous interests, indigenous in digital sequence information. Maui also leads a new research program focusing on tikana and technology, indigenous approaches to transforming data ecosystems. It's my pleasure now to welcome Associate Professor Maui Hudson. Good Angela, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here and um, just uh, thanks to MC for uh, sending through the invitation uh, to be a part of BioInfo Summer. Um, I'm going to put my slides on and, uh, and continue from there. Just first off, just want to uh, say thanks again for being a part of this. I'm generally going to talk about Indigenous perspectives on equity, diversity and data science and genomics. And um, I guess it arises from a whole range of experiences, which I'll share as we go through the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I too want to add my acknowledgements to country, um, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I also need to acknowledge and celebrate Waikato Tainui. Uh, so that's the tribe on whose traditional lands I live and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And then also introduce you to my country, which is um, in the Whakatohe region. So ko Mākio Te Maunga, uh, ko Waiawa Te Awa, ko Mātātua Te Waka, ko Whakatohe Te Iwi, uh, ko Māori Hudson Te Gungwa. And um, this, is, um, this is my country, so Te Rohe o Te Whakatohe, uh, we're a coastal people um, as well as an, an inland people as well. And this is about three hours away from the University of Waikato where I, um, where I work in Hamilton. Um, but I'm still um, fairly well connected um, being on the tribal council. So often working across both thinking about um, tribal interests um, as well as general sort of Maori interests or indigenous interests. Um, across a range of, of research areas. And so as a little bit of a background um, to the sorts of things that I've done, I've 
actually trained as a phys- I was a trained physiotherapist and that was my first life. And then after spending a bit of time overseas, um, got into postgraduate study and that was around the area of ethics and particularly Māori ethics and Māori research ethics and was involved in putting together some guidelines for Māori research ethics and started working for a Crown Research Institute, which I guess is a sort of a mini version of CSIRO. And that was with a group that was involved with doing forensics for the police. So started thinking about or talking about DNA in that context. And they also were establishing an envirogenomics program. And uh, there's another sort of a different context where uh, DNA was being used and thought about and certainly in a forensics uh, context where um, unfortunately there's a number of uh, Māori um, that are uh, within the sort of the criminal justice sector and having their DNA um, taken as part of criminal investigations, really thinking about the sorts of ethics that are involved in the process of, not only the process of collection, but also how it gets used and what kinds of uh, new techniques could be applied um, as it came about. And here in New Zealand, we've just had a, the Law Commission release a report on the use of DNA and um, highlighted you know, some issues, some ethical issues that emerge in that context. That some of those experiences then led me to getting involved in projects that started to think about how um, Māori become a part of um, genetic research, genomic research, and we had a project um, which you see here in the middle, Te Mata Ira, and created guidelines for genomic research with Māori, and um, also through that project um, created guidelines for biobanking, given that a lot of times the um, the data being generated, all the samples being generated through research projects aren't just being used for that single project, they're being used for, or they're being stored and held and used for secondary um, and consented for secondary use. And the project which I'm sort of in the process of completing at the moment uh, is on the right hand side, Te Nohonga Kaitiaki, where we've shifted away from a, a human context and started thinking about indigenous flora and fauna. And so we're um, developing guidelines for genomic research on what we call Tonga species. And what I did want to do, and, and one of the things that um, we've tried to do through this process, and, and this is relevant in the context of, you know, thinking about equity and thinking about diversity and thinking about ways in which um, diverse communities can engage in conversations around genetics. And it's important because for the most part, almost every community understands genetics at a basic level um, in relation to how they're connected to people, different traits that run through families, um, how they would uh, grow crops and, um, you know, and select for particular traits within, um, you know, out of, out of that, um, out of that area. And so these uh, terms, which you see in front of you, which won't be familiar to any of you because they're all uh, sort of Māori terms, but these are the sorts of Māori words and Māori concepts that would come up whenever we talked about genetics. And so the one in the middle there, whakapapa, um, is really about uh, kind of connections and genealogy. But you can think about those sorts of connections, not only in, in a, a sort of a scientific genetic context, but also a social or behavioral context and the way that people collect, connect and relate to each other. And so the, the word above it, taonga, that means something that's precious. And so we'll talk about um, DNA itself as being a taonga, um, the samples as being a taonga. Um, the data that's been generated from it being a taonga. So all of those things that are generated are something precious. Uh, there's something that have, um, in some instances, a, a cultural value, or there's a value that gets generated uh, within the research domain. And that's something that um, we would use the word tapu, but needs to be managed. So anything that has value, you don't just leave lying around, you look after it, you make sure it's, um, you make sure it's protected, you make sure it's being looked after in the right way. And so 
that's what we think in the context of uh, DNA is that that needs to be managed in the right way. And so the next um, the next concept down here, takoha, is really uh, it's really a gift. And I often think about um, when people are consenting for their samples to be used that it's a that it's a gift, and that we're gifting um, the samples to the research team. But what emerged over the course of our conversations is what we want to do is not gift the samples, but gift the responsibility associated with looking after them. And that becomes uh, a way then of the, res uh, the researchers being responsible for looking after uh, that DNA, that genetic information, in a way which um, the communities themselves would expect. And so if we're uh, passing over this responsibility to a research team, to an institution, we have to you know, give them an idea about what sorts of principles we expect them to follow, what kinds of things should they be doing when they're making decisions, or what, should guide, what sorts of things should guide their decisions, and uh, some of the protocols that might be in place to, to guide those actions. And so we've ended up with uh, these three different, um, these three other different concepts. And so the concept itself of Modi is more related to a life force. But when we're thinking about it um, in this space, it's about what's the, the level of integrity. Um, so how's the system operate? Is the system operating in a way which the community would look at and say, actually, those guys are legit. Um, they do the right thing. Uh, the next one, Wairua, which um, is really uh, talks about spirit, but in this context, we talk about the level of comfort. So in terms of people that are consenting for their material to be used, do they have a level of comfort about how that happens? Um, not, at the, not only at the time in which they consent, but into the future. So five years down the track, are they still comfortable that they've given some DNA samples to, a, to a, a research team and that they're being looked after and used in an appropriate manner. And that can be thought about not only in the context of the individual, but in the context of the community. So is the community comfortable about the continual use of this DNA that might be collected from a range of individuals across their, um, across their community and involve others as well. And similarly, um, mana, which you know, is about power and authority, but here thinking about the level of control and so what level of control can be enabled both uh, not only through consent and ensuring that consent is um, is gained from individuals but also governance and so that the uh, community is enabled to stay uh, involved in the project as it as it moves along and so here we are as of you know just described the, the principles um, and these are sort of terms uh, or, or at least statements make sense to us in the Māori context, ke tau te wairua te tangata, but really about that level of comfort, ke pūmo te mano te tangata, the level of control, and ke hiki te mauri o te up and level of integrity. So any decision which a research team is making about secondary use of data or samples should be thinking about these things and saying, is the decision I'm making likely to maintain the level of comfort, control, and integrity as viewed by the community. And those things happen within these different sorts of spaces. One, um, they get operationalized at the, the point where um, consent is gained, where the, uh, the DNA is, or the, the sample is shared. Um, and then there's this whole big period in the middle where um, we talk about te hau te tong or the spirit of the gift so that all of the decisions that are being made, hopefully using these principles, are in keeping with the spirit in which it was given. Now, whether that's being maintained in terms of consent conditions or thinking about it a little bit more satirically, that's what's, what's kind of anticipated through that middle part. And at some point in the future, there's a return or whether that's a return of the samples, whether that's return of data, whether that's return of uh, sort of research reports that tell the people or the community, this is what we did with these samples that you gave us.
this is what we've learned from it and you know thank you very much so the um that's the that sort of those sorts of ideas were the ones that emerged in the context of of humans and as we're starting to think about it across um how do we think about indigenous flora and fauna? How do we think about what a what a what a tonga is in, in other spaces, or sort of non-human spaces? Um, what that means in terms of indigenous species? What does it mean in terms of um, samples that might emerge from indigenous biota? And then how how are those things managed as they become samples, as they become data, and um, as people look for bioactives that sit within them, and that all of those things may have different uh, stewards or people that are responsible for looking after them, um, depending on the place in which they're, they're housed and stored. So this, um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that these conversations just aren't happening here in Aotearoa in New Zealand, but they're also happening in Australia as well. And, um, you know, he's a, I'm not playing this video, but you can find this um, video where it you know, tries to talk about um, uh, DNA and genetics and frame it uh, within the Aboriginal context and help them understand what it, uh, what it means as it becomes part of a research project and as it creates data as well. And there's a range of other people um, like uh, Azur Humez at the top there, um, Alex Brown at Samri, Greg Pratt at uh, the Queensland Institute of Medical Research that have been involved in these sorts of discussions and trying to help communities engage around genetic research but also engage in the right way. And those sorts of conversations are continuing in, in New Zealand as well um, with a range of different agencies from Genomics Aotearoa to some of our uh, research institutes like Plant and Food Research, um, the Royal Society, that have been supporting conversations that take place, not only around genetics and genomics, but also gene editing. And as soon as you start kind of moving along that, um, that spectrum towards genetic modification, it certainly becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more anxiety and worry and fear about what's involved through a whole range of um, opposition from Māori groups uh, when genetic modification, uh, sort of those sorts of debates emerged in the early 2000s. Um, but what we're seeing now is often a, a whole series of pretty mature um, discussions and conversations about the value of genetics, about the value of genomics, and about how they might participate in conversations about gene editing and when that might be appropriate. So it's not so much about this is a blanket, a blanket, no, we won't do this, but actually we need to be involved in the conversations about when, it, when it's used and for what purposes. And so this has um, been kind of a very interesting development here over the last, last few years. It's been supported in, in some ways, uh, as Angela mentioned, by um, the work we've been doing around uh, the summer internship for Indigenous genomics. And so we have this program here, Sing Aotearoa, which was established to provide uh, undergraduate students or Māori undergraduate or postgraduate students or Māori members of the community a chance to come together and learn more about the sort of the field of genomics. So not just um, the wet lab stuff, the things they do in the lab around extraction of DNA, but also bioinformatics, uh, the ethical issues, the cultural issues as we've been um, talking about them, and uh, give them uh, the chance to not only learn about these things, but also meet different people that are involved in the field. So that if they're uh, ever in the position where their community is being asked to engage in a research project, a genomics research project, they feel like they have a degree of confidence around what sort of advice they might give the community or have networks which they could involve as well. And so we started this program uh, five years ago, uh, 2015, um, and we've shifted it around the country. So 
Um, we'll hold it in uh, one place to allow people from that area to come and be a part of it and slowly move it um, around other areas. Always having probably around, you know, up to 20 uh, people participating, inviting uh, colleagues from overseas to participate as well. We have um, a range of faculty from different institutions that will come and provide the advice. Those faculty members are both Māori and non-Māori. And um, we always start our uh, sort of week-long um, week workshops um, by spending the first day on a marae. And then that day becomes, well, we'll still talk about genetics, we'll still talk about ethics, but we'll do it within that context. And this was a really interesting one. This was our uh, one from 2019, where we went to a place called Ngāti Huia. And uh, that was their name. And the huia bird is extinct. And um, there's a picture of it there. And it was the community um, that we went and visited and it was hosting us for this day had been involved in conversations about the extinction. And so people that were wanting to uh, look at some of the preserved, um, preserved birds, would it be possible to extract DNA? Would it be possible to bring this um, species back to life? And so that was a interesting um, discussion for the people that came along that were there to to be able to have that was actually real and grounded in conversations that the community themselves were having. And we're um, really fortunate in the sense that it wasn't something that we created, but it was something that we copied from from the um, the US. And so the summer internship for it was originally natives and gene genomics. Uh, was established there probably four years before we started. And um, we were able to use the program which they developed and develop, uh, create a sort of an international network where we would invite uh, members of their community, uh, members of their faculty to come to our workshops and we would send our faculty members back. And when we had a bit of extra resource, we would send some of our alumni um, across as well. And uh, you'll see there there's, um, have been fortunate to have a couple of visits um, to the different places they've moved it around. So one was with Arizona and then another one up in Seattle. And so as I mentioned, um, it originally started in the, the USA um, and then we started in 2015. But since then there's also been um, this program established in Canada. And last year, just over a year ago, was the first time the program had run here, uh, yet there where you are in Australia, and um, and that's been that's been um, great to see how this is uh, the program has um, expanded across these different uh, different countries, and so with uh, <coughs> our program hitting its fifth year. We decided it was probably time to try and do something a bit a bit bigger and grander, and so we held um, the first ever Indigenous Genomics Conference. So that was um, at the University of Waikato, where I work, um, at the beginning of this year. Uh, you'll see the the picture of um, the people that um, came along and participated, and we held an alumni gathering beforehand, where uh, different members um, that had been on Sing programs before were all invited back. We had people that were a part of Sing from other countries come along as well and um, came to the gathering and then stayed for the conference. And it was, um, you know, it was a really, a really great event. And all of the speakers um, at the conference were Indigenous or they were either Indigenous or they were speaking, um, speaking alongside an Indigenous partner. And I think that was a, a really um, kind of unique uh, unique experience. And this is, um, this was, oh, we were, we invited uh, the chief editor for Nature Genetics to come to the, to come to the conference. And she wrote this editorial um, afterwards, um, you know, saying that, you know, she'd been, been at this international conference in, in digital genomics. 
that, that indigenous communities and scientists have much to contribute to genetic research and they're making their voices heard. And she's very supportive about um, the need for this community to be more active in terms of promoting diversity and um, creating opportunities for uh, indigenous indigenous peoples to be more involved in um, in this community. And so, I want to take a little bit of a a little bit of a shift here um, away from what's what has really been this these capacity building initiatives. And it's been about um, building awareness, uh, having people feel comfortable about engaging in, in sort of the genomic space, and talk a little bit about why it's necessary. And while we uh, uh, have support for uh, more Indigenous participation, um, that it's because there's other things happening that, that we also need to respond to. And one of them sits here in, in terms of this um, moves towards open science and moves towards open data. And as you see here in this, um, in this science article, towards unrestricted use of public genomic data. And that the community, the science community at large is saying that actually all this data that's being generated should be available and should be available to everyone. And that's interesting in the context of um, a whole range of initiatives that are uh, receiving funding and being supported. So you've got things like the DNA Zoo, uh, where they're um, looking to sequence the DNA from every mammal on the planet. And so there's different um, kind of groups that contribute to DNA Zoo in, in different parts of the world. You've got the Earth Biogenome Project, and so this has a, a similar uh, a similar sort of intent, uh, creating a new foundation for biology, sequencing life for the future of life. Um, not only do they want to uh, sequence um, every species and you know every mammal, but also down to um, microorganisms. So, for the scientists amongst you, right down to the level of eukaryotes, but that's a whole um, a whole nother level of activity, and because you know the cost for sequencing, uh, the cost of sequencing has come down dramatically over the last decade. You're now able to do this in a whole variety of places, um, a whole variety of places around the world, and there's um, more and more, more and more of it happening. And so here you have the Earth Bank of Codes. And you know, making nature's biological assets visible and valuable, and so people see that actually part of the um, part of the next wave of uh, value creation is going to emerge from um, the biological space, and not from not from the farming, the farming, the forestry sector, and the sort of taking of the natural resources, but in terms of um, the biological um, resources that sit within those things, which won't necessarily have to be um, extracted from the products themselves, but once you know what the DNA sequence is, they can be um, synthetically generated as well. And so this whole um, connection between this activity of genome sequencing and what will then become a a new opportunity for commodification is all sitting around uh, beyond this. And so when we're um, thinking about uh, this sort of move towards where does, where does the opportunity to be a part of this um, kind of new biological revolution sit, and what then becomes um, issues for indigenous peoples, we have these ones sitting here around how do you recognize indigenous rights and interests in the data that's generated and the raw data and the digital sequence information, particularly within an open data environment. So if I say my community is agreeing to be a part of a project and it might be for a, a conservation purpose or a biodiversity purpose, 
that's something we're interested in having happen. Um, the species gets sequenced. That data goes up into an open, um, onto an open platform. Anyone around the world can access it. And someone on the other side of the world decides that actually they've found some sort of interesting bit in there which could have some commercial application. We're excluded from, from that process. So how can we still share that digital sequence information and collaborate around ethical access and use in ways that are consistent with our community protocols? And how can we do it in ways that allow us to negotiate equitable outcome from the use of that information, particularly if it um, heads down a commercialization track? And so uh, there's been a number of um, uh, a number of uh, researchers, a number of advocates, um, both indigenous and non-indigenous, that are interested in ensuring that um, there's more equity within the system, and that indigenous communities get to become a part of these um, these activities. And so we um, published an article around rights, interests, and expectations, indigenous views on the unrestricted access to genomic data, which was speaking back to um, the article that had been published in Science and putting forward an alternative view around the sorts of things we should be um, working towards. And that's more around building trust so that indigenous communities can decide whether their data and associated metadata are publicly available or accessible on request. So it's not necessarily about um, uh, locking it away so no one gets to use it, but just ensuring that the people that are going to use it have been vetted or have been checked to, to make sure their intent is, um, intent is good. Uh, thinking about enhancing accountability so that provenance as it relates to indigenous samples and genomic data is transparent and appears um, not only in the database, but also in publications. And improving equity, so that there's different ways that value can be attributed to communities, um, both to support future use, um, but benefit sharing arrangements as well. And so to support that, um, the move in that direction, I've been really thinking about in what ways can um, provenance as it relates to this indigenous data be maintained. And those ideas led me to, um, or ended up finding or stumbling across the system of labeling and particularly traditional knowledge labels. And so they were created by uh, Professor Jane Anderson, who's based at NYU, um, but is in Australia, um, who had expertise in indigenous, indigenous property, indigenous property law, IP law, um, and the, the challenges that had for how indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge could be managed, given that it was never um, able to get indigenous property rights and created these uh, traditional knowledge labels alongside um, indigenous communities to just show how um, their protocols could inform the, the ongoing use and access to their material that sat in different libraries and, and other institutions. And so the, uh, from there, we've been working together to develop biocultural labels, which could be applied to um, gene sequences as well. And the, di the digital, the labels themselves are digital tags um, intended to be machine readable. They help establish and maintain the provenance for uh, indigenous data and create durable and persistent cultural metadata. While the label itself is, um, or the icon itself, uh, is stable and doesn't change. Um, community control is maintained by allowing them to uh, define and customize the metadata associated with the labels. And so as an example, um, here is the label, which is the TK attribution one, which talks about why it should be used and that anyone who uses the material uh, 
people would like them to know who the correct sources, custodians and owners are. And it's particularly important if material that's sitting in institutions is being wrongly attributed or important names that were involved with making the material are missing. And so you see here an example of the, um, how the community themselves has customized the text that sits behind the, that sits behind the attribution label. And this is one that relates to the, um, the, Scarlet's, the Scarlet's people, part of a store, um, First Nations in British Columbia, in Canada. And they've, they've been using this as a part of uh, a website so that people that come to the website know that this is actually information that has um, been verified by them as correct and that they're comfortable for it being used for outreach and um, for non-commercial purposes. And so I just wanted to quickly go over um, this example here, um, which is one that's around the Passamaquoddy tribe. And so this is the, was the first ever recordings made on um, Indigenous First Nations lands in, um, in the US. And it was when they were actually testing the technology. So this was like new technology and they were, they were trialing it at the time. And so these recordings that were made and you see here, um, this is the, the catalog record uh, of a Passamaquoddy wall stone. And that's the only bit of information that connects it back to that community. Uh, the rights are held by the Peabody Museum uh, at Harvard University. And other than that, this record is pretty impoverished. Um, and here's what the record looks like now. Uh, since, you know, and this has been a, a, a conversation between the community and the institutions over a, a long period of time. But there's a whole lot, there's a much richer cultural record that's been added here. And part of the reason the community are comfortable with, with bringing this additional knowledge to the record is because the labels are sitting there, which talking about the attribution, how it connects back to them, that they're fine for it to be used for outreach and it's for non-commercial purposes. And so this record is still publicly available. Um, but one that provides more value both to the general public as well as the, uh, the Pasmaquoddy community. And so this is the front facing um, aspect of the, of the record, but sitting behind that is the need to make changes to the infrastructure. And so um, within uh, the digital infrastructure, for, for those of you who know, this is a, a JSON file and they've created a field for traditional knowledge labels to enable the labels to be reflected on the record. Now, so that the change in this infrastructure means that labels can now be added to any item within the Library of Congress. So any other community that wants to apply the labels, it doesn't have to go through the, um, the process of having the changes made um, in the back room. And this was the other thing that was really um, appealed to me as I came across the labels and that the labels themselves were represented within the rights advisory. And so they sit alongside the intellectual property rights held by the Peabody Museum, but sit there as the first rights um, and sit there alongside. So people will know uh, that if they would like to do things with it, they should be engage also engaging with the Pasmaquoddy uh, community themselves. And so we moved um, looking at that example and how it was applying there and thinking about how could we apply this in the, in the context of genomics and have created these six um, bicultural labels as a starting point for how they might be used. Uh, a provenance label, a consent verified label, a label that um, uh, reflects the ability to maintain research use, um, and open to collaboration and open to commercialization, and then a uh, multiple community label. So just recognizing that uh, species don't confine themselves to a tribal boundary. And so while my um, community might like to put a, uh, a label on, that talks about our relationship with that thing, we can also acknowledge that there are other communities that might have a relationship uh, to it as well. And so 
you know, we've been working with a range of places, including Geome, which is a metadata database for genetic sequences. And you'll see at the bottom there uh, a notice which sits alongside the labels. And this is one that just um, indicates that this platform is open to collaborate and that they make use of the notices and labels within their, within their system. Uh, we've been talking with publishers about how um, labels might be reflected on, uh, uh, on publications and the landing pages for publications. And this is sort of a mock-up of what it might look like with nature. So a uh, the sort of the work that we've been doing with them um, in terms of their engagement with the, the SING Indigenous Genomics Conference is extended into wanting to work with them to create an Indigenous Genomics Collection and then thinking about whether or not the labels could be applied within the context of, of their um, processes. And so these, these um, developments, um, which are you know, kind of great to see happening in isolation and so associated with different projects, really um, to be effective need to be embedded in an in infrastructure in a much kind of larger way. And so that's where my involvement in Genomics Aotearoa, which is a national consortia, um, has come along. They're, you know, building capacity around genomics and bioinformatics, um, but also capacity around Te Ao Māori, and have made a commitment that they'll partner with Māori at all levels, including the guardianship of data. And uh, they have been working towards creating a Genomics Aotearoa data repository, which would be a place where data would still be accessible on request, but it would be, you know, controlled. Uh, to a degree and that there would be uh, Māori governance as a part of that and thinking about what an Indigenous genomics platform might look like. So how can uh, Māori communities become more involved in different sorts of genomics research that are, that are undertaken. And so an important part of the conversation has really been one around um, what happens with the data and um, and who gets a, a say about it. And increasingly there's been this um, discourse about Indigenous data sovereignty and the rights and interests that Indigenous communities have in data that's being generated. Data that's generated about themselves as people, but also about um, their lands, their territories, the things that live on there, and how, how those emerge. And it draws on ideas around Indigenous rights and treaty rights, cultural intellectual property rights, um, and ideas from Indigenous research ethics as well. And there's two main themes, one around the ability for communities to access data that's being generated, uh, so it helps them with the decisions which they need to make uh, to support you know, governance decisions in their community, so that's data for governance. And then if other people are able to access the data, and this is particularly when we're thinking about it shifting into these open data spaces, um, how can they be involved in the governance of data and manage access to data to ensure it's relevant and responsive? And so, you know, there is this challenge that sits in place uh, around these competing interests. And they're not just a competing interest between an indigenous community and a scientific community, but a competing in, uh, interest for our indigenous communities themselves. And that, you know, there is support for open data and open science. We are tr trying to increase the amount of indigenous participation in the STEM subjects, um, ability to be a part of cutting edge science and technology, to be a part of commercialization projects. Um, and at the same time, we do have these aspirations for greater control of Indigenous data and Indigenous data sovereignty. So there's a, um, a goal in mind for Indigenous communities to benefit from innovation and development via greater control of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous data. And I think that's where um, I'll leave things. You know, this. Uh, at the kind of its, its largest level, it's you know really about this idea of indigenous control around indigenous data, whether it's genomic data or other, 
is really about the ability to control the narratives that are generated. And that ability to do that is so that we can have greater control over delivery around our aspirations. So, um, kia ora. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Um, hanging in there for, uh, for then sharing these ideas and be happy to um, answer questions. Thank you very much, Maui, for that um, really fascinating talk on some really important work that's happening in the space, both by you and others. Maui, first up, Pat's asked if you'll repeat the ref reference to Jane Anderson and the signage as well. So perhaps if you can go back to that slide that you have. Uh, okay. Um, so you, you can find um, information about the traditional knowledge labels at um, localcontext.org. And they've been, you know, she's been working on the traditional, developing the traditional knowledge labels for um, nearly 10 years, working alongside a number of communities. We've been working on the biocultural labels for the last sort of 18 months or so. Um, and they've, they've essentially been in a development phase and we're um, just moving into a, a testing phase for them as well. Great. Um, so Benjamin's asked, how does this all relate to the Nagoya Protocol and the fact that many nature papers don't have any authors from the countries the genetic research has taken place, e.g. African countries? Yeah, sure. And so that was um, part of the reason that, that sits behind it. In New, in New Zealand, we have um, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, there's been a claim for cultural intellectual property rights called Y262. So in a local context, that's sort of driving this, um, some of the responsiveness uh, internally around uh, recognition of Indigenous rights. The Nagoya Protocol um, expects, you know, a fair and equitable benefit sharing um, from genetic resources. And there's a couple of elements to that, which are sort of been an interesting part of those negotiations. So one is it applies to genetic resources and not genomic data. So digital sequence information is specifically excluded. Um, and it also excludes human, uh, human genetics as well. Uh, and that, those, those came about, I think partly on the basis of these sort of discussions and global discussions and debate between the um, developed countries and the developing countries, and certainly Africa and some of the more um, developing countries wanted DSI to be included. Um, Part of the part of the challenge has been, or part of the challenge that's been expressed by people, is that it's actually too difficult, um, and it's, it's impractical to try and recognise interest in data in the way that it's shared. But I think we're um, trying to demonstrate that actually that the idea of impracticality isn't one that needs to be. Uh, well, it's something that can, we can get around, and that's what we're trying to do with the the labels project. Great. Um, so Teresa has a question. Could you talk about the potential harms to an Indigenous community by making their genomic data available? Yeah, so there's, there's a few different harms that, um, that often get expressed. And sometimes communities are, and I want to say it's, it's talked about in the context of the, the, the genetic data but often it's the use of that data. So the data itself doesn't necessarily cause the harm, but if it's used to challenge their creation stories, then it becomes problematic. If it's used to um, challenge claims they might be making about resources in the area, then it becomes a problem. If it's, and, and particularly in this sort of, kind of the, the, the Nagoya space, if it's used to generate value which then isn't shared in any kind of way with them, communities feel aggrieved by that. And so I know in you know, New Zealand, there's lots of conversations about the fact that um, uh, overseas companies have patented plants from New Zealand and now that, that, that sort of control sits in those places. And so I don't think there's some people that don't like the idea of commercialization you know, some people in our communities that don't think that it's um, philosophically the sort of the right approach we should be taking. And then there's others that um, are open to it as long as it benefits our communities. Right. Um, Gary Newsom 
uh, asked if you'd be able to describe one or two case studies that describe how the principles and processes you and others um, are developing have played out in practice. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually, so, so there are, there are, um, there are definitely um, a few examples around, but I think they're, they tend to be um, odd examples here and there. There's an um, example in New Zealand around a stomach cancer gene. And I think what, what you've found is that um, when you've had a sort of like a tightly defined community or a tightly, def you know, whether that's a family group or a, or a particular community that's um, involved, then, and they've had, um, sorry, someone, someone from that community that's, that's familiar with the processes, they can then negotiate what those things look like. So with this um, family that was, um, they were looking for a stomach cancer gene um, in New Zealand. They worked with the uh, University of Otago around that, and they just came up with their own um, ways of sort of data sharing agreements, but also IP IP agreements. And it just gets negotiated. It's, there's places where they've been able to negotiate what that looks like. I think in lots of places, the default position is that the institute owns everything. Um, that the the information increasingly will be made available on open data platforms and that's for publishing purposes. Um, so there's this pressure that pu pushes in that direction and doesn't allow um, communities to be involved. Uh, the other example is the kakapo genome. So I don't know if you know the, um, the kakapo, it's a uh, native parrot in New Zealand and they have sequenced um, it's an endangered bird, but they've sequenced every living example of, you know, every, every living, yeah, every living example of the population, like every living member of the population, which is, I think, you know, runs around 130 odd. And that data is, um, uh, has got all sorts of kind of usefulness, but it's got a controlled, um, or there's a, there's a data access protocol to get access to it. And the, the local tribe is a part of the committee alongside other researchers that makes decisions about, um, you know, who gets access and for what purposes. Right. Um, so Hardup's just come in, he's saying, great work, Maui. I was wondering how can a non-Indigenous person who shares similar interests can become champions for carrying the message forward, especially if they are in a position of influence? Yeah, well, look, that's um, that's exactly what we're looking for, you know, <laughs> because you know, for the most part, it's um, you know, there's what we've what we've come across as we've been going around is there's lots of people that would like to do the right thing, um, you know, they're not necessarily getting engaged in projects because they have a commercial outcome in mind, but the way in which they're expected to operate facilitates that outcome. And um, that is not necessarily an outcome they're looking for. And so how do you, um, you know, you can do your, uh, the right sort of work and the right sort of consultation with a, with a community um, to uh, generate some data. And then it sort of moves beyond your control. And so that's where we're trying to go in terms of um, the use of the labels is to allow you as a researcher or as an institution to recognize that these interests exist and then enable the, the communities the chance to put their protocols against it. And so I think this is where um, thinking about changes in uh, uh, how we can make visible in the infrastructure and the metadata, this sort of information becomes important. Seems like a little bit of a dry exercise in, in lots of ways that it's um, trying to support behavior change and creating a new sort of standard of practice amongst the, amongst the community. Yeah, great. Well, I think this, this question may lead into that, lead on from that um, well. Uh, Nicholas asked, have you considered approaching the preprint pre archives, so bio R X I V and med R X I V to implement the labels? No, but it'd be great if someone got in touch with me and <laughs> help to kind of make those sorts of connections is um, we've been having uh, a series of discussions. Uh, there's a, we have an Australian biocultural labels working group 
Um, we've been throwing up a few proposals to try and get um, things along. That involves um, some people from universities, but also uh, ones from people from different communities as well. They've been interested in, you know, testing it and testing it in different contexts. We've had conversations with people at the Atlas of Living Australia, um, with CSIRO, IATSIS, uh, you know, kind of different places where um, it might uh, they might start being adopted and used. I mean, it will take a little while for it to kind of work its way through through the system, but we just need to um, establish it around some projects and in some institutions to, to kick it off. Yeah, of course. Um, so there's a question here from Rhonda. Um, went up against a wave of surely everyone agrees this is a good idea. Is there a way to say stop? Um, she said she's thinking of the move to open data and the very real risk of the modification but can apply to many aspects of genomics research, e.g. gene editing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's um, that's one of the rights that a number of the communities often want to uh, maintain is the right to say no. And it um, ends, up, ends up being hard. Well, well, not hard, but, you know, there's the, 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 as much as you have the right to say no here, someone else also has the right to say yes. And that might be this community on this side is interested in continuing and this one wants to say no. Um, but uh, I guess creating creating space for those those discussions to take place. I think at the moment, a lot of it just sort of defaults and because it becomes too hard, people just move on and, and do it anyway. Um, I don't think that answered the question very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's pro probably, probably quite a tricky one. Yeah, tough one there. Um, so Bastian's asked, uh, Kilo Fox proposed models of equitable benefit sharing where communities or individuals reap the monetary benefits of research efforts and output. Um, do you think it can apply to New Zealand and Australia? Um, yeah, for sure. So um, Kilo is uh, one of the people involved with um, Sing in the USA, and uh, he's been one of the guest um, guest lecturers that came out to Aotearoa for, for our SING program as well. Um, he is, yeah, and I, I think that, you know, that there is that area where you have to start thinking about um, kind of equity will only, won't come about just by kind of putting labels on things and allowing people, it, it'll be what follows from that. And so how, how you can generate, um, I don't know, a degree of fairness in how these things happen. I think it's, so this is going to get all a, a little bit, little bit larger all of a sudden, but if we felt that the government acted in our interests and was um, uh, taking a fair, say a fair cut from kind of multinational corporations and then feeding it back in to provide services for us, then we might be more comfortable with how things roll at the moment. That, that the value can kind of be aggregated into these entities because it gets shared up. But the way things have gone and the fact that most of them don't pay that much tax at all means that there's no benefit back to the either the indigenous community or, or oftentimes the public, the public at large. So can you get involved, if you're not getting anything out of the back end in that way, how do you get involved in the front end of these conversations? And that's where, you know, creating some transparency about these relationships um, is intended to try and do that. Now, how that then translates into a way that that benefit can come back and whether it comes back to individual communities or sits within trust models, um, that's sort of a big question that I think people are working through, not only in this space, but in um, the data space generally. Yep, of course. Okay. Um, so, Terry asks, do you get resistance around these initiatives from the traditional science community? Um, I work with the people that want to want to want to help out. <laughs> so, so you know, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's people um, that are pretty comfortable with the status quo, and um, don't don't feel the need to make changes or feel that the changes the changes that need to take place need to take place with some you know someone else. And often, um, you know, when you're talking about these, um, these sorts of issues, people will go, well, you know, we, we don't, 
the, they're not coming through the system. It's a problem with the schooling because there's not enough people doing science down there so that we're not getting enough come in and do, they're not taking science at um, undergraduate level. And then we've got no one that's a PhD student. So, you know, it's not our problem to fix. It's, you know, somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in lots of ways, that's just a bit of a cop out because, you know, I think the, the building capacity is one way in which you can help. But, you know, as you see, if you can kind of create um, opportunities for communities, and that might be through uh, engaging with them, but that then, you know, you're thinking about changing, you know, who gets to be a part of deciding what um, what a research avenue looks like. And I think that, you know, some people are comfortable with with doing that and other ones want to maintain their academic academic freedom a little bit keep it a bit more closer to their chest. I think some of the policy agencies are encouraging more and more um, consultation and co-design in the development of research projects now and wanting to see that um, through its development. So you're kind of getting these, these sort of shifts in places that um, would support this coming about. Yeah, right. So well, this you may have answered this a little bit already, but if you've got anything else to add. So Hardup asked, what advice would you have for AMSI? or um, helping us build the capacity in data science? Yeah, they say, he keeps asking the hard questions. <laughs> right. He's already presented this morning, so he knows you can't. No, he, 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 did, did he not provide some answers? There, there was, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, look, um, so we, so the, the, the program, which I sort of indicated in the bio, which we, we didn't have, actually we didn't talk about here, um, was this new research program, Tikang and Technology, where it's more, not so much around the genetics, even though you know, a bunch of my interest in data science has sort of emerged from the space, but around um, data, data science more generally. And what we're hoping to do is actually create a sing-like program for data science and um, you know, be able to get people together. And, and pe- the people that come to sing aren't people that are necessarily studying genetics. So we get some people that come out of that, um, out of that as a discipline, but often they're coming out of the arts or law or somewhere else. And, um, but they're just interested in understanding more about it. And I think, you know, in the same space with um, data science, I'm not an expert in this and I'm not an expert in, in genomics either, but um, you know, you, you need to be able to sit with people that are and feel comfortable having conversations with them. And I think in, in that way, that's probably the place to start. Um, who are the people that want to get involved in a conversation with you because you can add value to some sort of um, something that's also of interest to them? Yeah, great. Well, I know we've got uh, several AMC people on the line, so we'll, we'll take some notes from that. Um, I think that's all the questions uh, we have for you tonight. So thank you once again for your presentation. I'm sure everyone got some really good takeaways um, and things to consider out of that. Um, We'll, we'll just presume everyone's clapping at home for you. <laughs> um, so that, that concludes our session tonight. So thanks again to Maui. Thank you all for joining us.